Hi guys, welcome back to First Chapter Friday. All right, the book I have for you today is called Crispin, The Cross of Lead, and it's by Avi. You can see the, the author is just Avi. He's written some fantastic books, um, The True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle. Like there's, he's one of my favorite authors, um, or she, I've never really looked. Uh, fantastic. You can see it has the Newbery Award, so that tells us it was the best book of that year. Um, I think it is a trilogy. I know there are sequels. That's why this is the very first book. So if you are interested, remember it's the first book is The Cross of Lead. So we're reading the first chapter of the first book of Crispin, and I hope you enjoy it. It's a, a pretty intense, exciting book. Okay, chapter one, uh, it says it's England, A.D., in the year 1377, and you can see, you know, kind of the font, and then we have a quote here. In the midst of life comes death. How often did our village priest preach these words? Yet, I have also heard that quote, in the midst of death comes life. If this be a riddle, so was my life. All right. The day after my mother died, the priest and I wrapped her body in a gray shroud and carried her to the village church. Our burden was not great. In life, she had been a small woman with little strength. Death made her even less. Her name had been Asta. Since our cottage was at the village fringe, fringe would be like on the edge, the priest and I bore her remains along the narrow, rutted road that led to the cemetery. A steady hissing rain had turned the ground to clinging mud. No birds sang, no bells tolled. The sun hid behind the dark and lowering clouds. We passed village fields where people were at work in the rain and mud. No one knelt. They simply stared. As they had shunned my mother in life, shun means like you ignore, you refuse to acknowledge them. So they ignored his mother. As they had shunned my mother in life, so they shunned her now. As for me, I felt, as I often did, ashamed. It was as if I contained an unnamed sin that made me less than nothing in their eyes. Other than the priest, my mother had no friends. She often was taunted by villagers. Taunted is like teased. Still, I had thought of her as a woman of beauty, as perhaps all children think upon their mothers. The burial took place among the other paupers' graves in the walled cemetery behind our church. It was there the priest and I dug her grave in the water-laden clay. There was no coffin. We laid her down with her feet toward the east, so when the day of judgment came, she would, may God grant it, rise up to face Jerusalem. As the priest chanted the Latin prayers, whose meaning I barely understood, I knelt by his side and knew that God had taken away the one person I could claim as my own, but his will be done. So all he had was his mother, and now his mother is dead. No sooner did we cover my mother's remains with heavy earth than John Ycliffe, the steward of the manor, appeared outside the cemetery walls. Though I had not seen him, he must have been watching us from astride his horse. Asta's son, come here, he said to me. Head bowed, I drew close. Look at me, he commanded, reaching down and forcing my head up with a sharp slap of his gloved hand beneath my chin. It was always hard for me to look on others. To look on John Eycliffe was hardest of all. His black bearded face, hard, sharp eyes and frowning lips forever scowled at me. When he deigned to look in my direction, he offered nothing but contempt. So he looks at him very negatively. For me to pass near was to invite his scorn, his kicks, and sometimes his blows. No one ever accused John Eycliffe of any kindness. In the absence of Lord Furnival, he was in charge of the manor, the laws, and the peasants. To be caught in some small transgression, missing a day of work, speaking harshly of his rule, failing to attend mass, brought an unforgiving penalty. It could be a whipping, a clipping of the ear, imprisonment, or a cut-off hand. For poaching a stag, so that would be stealing like a, a um, uh, or killing like a stag is a male deer. John, Ale, John, the ale maker's son, was put to death on the commons gallows. As judge, jury, and willing executioner, Eycliffe had but to give the word, and the offender's life was forfeit. We all lived in fear of him. Eycliffe stared at me for a long while, as if in search of something. All he said, however, was, With your mother gone, you're required to deliver your ox to the manor house tomorrow. It will serve as the death tax. So when someone died, you had to pay tax. But, sir, I said, for my speech was slow and ill-formed, if I do, I, I won't be able to work the fields. Then starve, he said, and rode away without a backward glance. 
Father Quinnell whispered into my ear, come to church, Asta's son, we'll pray. Too upset, I only shook my head. God will protect you, he said, resting his hand on my shoulder, as he now protects your mother. His words only distressed me more. Was death my only hope? Seeking to escape my heart's cage of sorrow, I rushed off toward the forest. Barely aware of the earth beneath my feet or the roof of the trees above, I paid no mind into what I ran or that my sole garment, a gray wool tunic, tore on brambles and bushes. Nor did I care that my leather shoes catching roots and stones kept tripping me, causing me to fall. Each time I picked myself up and rushed on panting, crying. Deeper and deeper into the ancient woods I went, past thick bracken and stately woods until I tripped and fell again. This time, as God in his wisdom would have had it, my head struck stone. Stunned, I lay upon the decaying earth, fingers clutching rooted leaves, a cold rain drenching me. As daylight faded, I was entombed in a world darker than any night could bring. This poor kid, it gets more intense. Like somebody ends up wanting him dead and there's like this whole mystery behind his mother and it's like you have to kind of figure it all out. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, that was Crispin, The Cross of Lead by Avi and we will see you next time. Thanks for joining.